For most of this pandemic, England had been doing far worse than the rest of Europe. But even we have gotten the cases under control and the daily cases and deaths have dropped right off and continue heading the right way towards zero. The spotlight is off us, and now onto countries like America and Brazil which are faring the worst, with crazy figures like 50,000 new cases a day. This pandemic has educated me on certain trends and delays in reporting. The country shuts down over the weekend, so the statistics for these days are all reported at once on the following Tuesday, leading to a spike in cases. If you aren't used to this, then the weekend figures could reassure you that everything's getting better, only for Tuesday stats to make it all seem out of control again. Another delay in reporting comes from the virus's incubation period. It means that today's figures actually represent infections from several weeks ago. So 600 cases a day before the boom is scary because you know that on the day of reporting, it's probably a lot higher than that. But 600 cases now, as cases are dropping, reassures you that today the new cases are likely quite a bit lower than what's being reported. As an example, yesterday's 581 new cases actually represents the situation a week or so ago. The problem with this is that it gives people freedom to twist the narrative somewhat. Like earlier today, Trump posted this tweet claiming that the death toll was down tenfold. That's a rather vague yet incredibly bold claim, especially coming from the country worst hit by the virus and documenting record numbers of infections per day. Looking at the numbers, you can see what he's getting at. Much like England, America's reporting stops for the weekend and then comes back in full force on Monday. Or in this case, for whatever reason, Tuesday. So Trump is comparing the weekend's numbers with the peak of the death rate. It is, indeed, ten times lower. Now if I'm honest, I can't explain why the death rate has dropped as much as it has. The new cases being announced per day haven't dropped off much since the initial boom, so I would have expected deaths to remain higher than they are. So that's good news. It could be that treatments have gotten more effective, that the country's capacity to treat has increased, or that it's now more active in places with younger and healthier people. I don't know, but I feel it's too soon to be celebrating a low death rate. In fact, the timing of Trump's tweet couldn't have been worse since it could lead Americans into a false sense of security, believing the worst to be over. But this new surge in cases is ominous, and I expect the deaths from this to occur sometime between now and the end of the month. If it gets to the end of July and the death rate hasn't risen, then Trump might have been right. But from the new figures, it's not a good start. While I predict the end of July could result in lots of deaths in America, it could also lead to an increase in cases in England too, because the lockdown was greatly eased on July the 4th, of all days. Since lockdown was imposed, the rules have been loosened a few times, but this is the biggest easing so far. The two metre distancing rule was dropped to just one metre. I no longer notice large queues for shops, though customer limits are still in place. Outdoor places and spaces like parks and zoos have reopened, as have hairdressers. My hair's now reached down to my eyes and halfway up to the ceiling, so it's about time I made the most of this. I see that driving instructors are back to work as well. The one I saw was wearing a mask, though oddly the person learning to drive was not. Small indoor gatherings are now permitted, but the big one that everybody's focused on has been the reopening of pubs. Reddit was quick to fill with posts like this, and I know that the coronavirus isn't specifically mentioned, but the post's success is clearly due to the implications with it and how this unnecessary reopening will set back the country's progress. The idea being that England's about to go wild and will bring about a second wave of infections thanks to widespread alcohol dependency and poor judgement. There's always a compromise between saving lives and keeping the economy turning. The correct balance will always be learned with hindsight and past mistakes seriously judged and punished in retrospect. But rather than to talk about my own opinions on the pub's reopening, I decided to go out and to film the situation in my own city of Plymouth. Home to 300,000 is the biggest city in the southwest beyond Bristol, and being quite a bit less classy than places like Exeter, if anywhere's going to embrace the pub's reopening, it's going to be here. Having normally been the one embracing the nightlife experience, it was quite odd to go out with the sole intention of documenting it. I didn't know what to expect, really. Either for it to be completely quiet, or for it to be the busiest night of the year. It turned out to be neither. Approaching the town centre, the pubs I encountered were all closed. It doesn't seem like everywhere's reopened simply because they've been able to. I didn't go up there, but looking up North Hill towards the studenty places, it seemed quiet. That's no surprise, since normally it doesn't get busy up there until after midnight. The town centre was quieter than normal too. Eerily so. Bear in mind that this was taken at about 8pm on a Saturday night, so most shops would be closed by now normally. I strongly believe that the weather determines if people go out more than lockdown does. Just sucks that the weather's been so good this year right up until things began reopening. Next I headed to the big places like Weatherspoons and stuff, 
If anywhere's going to be open, it'll be here. And sure enough, they were. I don't think social distancing was being practiced in the queues around the front. But even with that, it was noticeably quieter than normal, and it was nice to see that in Weatherspoons, partitions had been put up between the tables. It didn't look overly busy. I imagine there's some kind of one-in, one-out policy. Unless you're really desperate for a night out, I don't think the ambiance here would have made it particularly inviting. Though I guess it would be worth it if you really wanted to know what a night out in partial lockdown feels like. I then headed up to the seaside. There aren't shops and bars up here, but it's an open space that's used a lot when the weather's good. Had it been a hot sunny evening, then there probably would have been hundreds of groups sat about and cooking with barbecues up here. But with the weather being bad, there was barely anybody up here at all. And last I headed around to the Barbican, which is down by the docks. This is a place full of traditional pubs and live performances. It mostly closes after midnight, and if I had to describe the average group here normally, it would be overweight middle-aged women not wearing a lot and smoking. But today it seemed populated by younger people, and it was busy. It was a welcome surprise after the depressing state of the rest of the city's nightlife. Were people socially distancing? Not a lot. Would coronavirus spread in a place like this? Probably even though it seemed like most people were using the outdoor spaces and facilities, which might have been why the bars along here were so busy. As far as nights out go, the atmosphere here was quite nice and it all seemed friendly and under control. Police were about and there were lifeguards around should anybody drunkenly fall into the harbour. By now it was approaching 9 o'clock and I decided to head back home. But there you have it, the first night of reopening didn't make the city go crazy. It's not going to rampantly spread the disease to every resident overnight. Overall, it was quiet for a Saturday night, bar a few key locations. I can't speak for what happened later and wasn't exactly going to sit around all night documenting it for you, but I was quite impressed with how my city didn't go crazy on the first night. Coming back to the issue of coronavirus, we will know the consequences of the pubs reopening by the end of the month. I would be surprised if cases didn't go up a bit, or at least stopped dropping, because if it doesn't, then why on earth do we bother closing the pubs in the first place? It seems a few small actions can make a big difference. Lockdown is obviously a big action, but it's still reassuring to know that it can change the trajectory from exponential growth to rapid decline in a matter of months. Swap coronavirus out for other diseases, and I wonder if it would be the same. Obviously, in theory, it should work, but it's still nice to know that it works in practice as well. With the measures easing, it feels like the government's experimenting on the sweet spot and testing how much it can get away with before the coronavirus's spread begins to get out of hand again. So far, I'm happy with how much we've managed to get away with. Let's give it time to see if this latest step is the one that goes too far. What England's doing now is localised lockdowns. This happened in Leicestershire recently. But down here, cases have been virtually non-existent. While it seems like a mistake to try and change that, it would be a missed opportunity not to reopen some of the businesses down here. Also, I think I've been a little out of the loop because since last time, everybody started talking about pillars, which certainly wasn't a thing earlier on. Pillars represents how the cases are confirmed. Pillar 1 is when it's being processed by a lab. Pillar 2 can be counted when the swab test is sent out to suspected cases. I expect this whole pillar system is a response to how the UK botched its testing figures for its monthly target a while back, requiring a better way of measuring the different stages of the testing process. It's all rather confusing to me, but it seems like there are four different pillars at last count. As with the last few videos, I didn't know if I'd bother making one this month, but while the boom is long gone, there are still interesting things to cover regarding the pandemic, even in a country where, for me at least, the word coronavirus is no longer used to describe the virus itself, but has instead become a broad term used to represent closure or excuses, the reason you can't do the things you like, an excuse to hate on the people, groups and countries you want to hate, and why 2020 will be a year we'll be happy to see the end of.